As you may know, the factor has been a passionate defender of the Christmas traditions in America. A war on Christmas. The war on Christmas. There's a war on Christmas. The war on Christmas. A war on Christmas. War on Christmas. The war on Christmas. Is there a war on Christmas? A conscious effort to try to take the religious meaning out of this holiday? I think that Christmas is getting a ho-ho-hos. There wasn't anybody else fighting this war on Christmas. Hi everyone, I'm Eric Letterman and this is Faith and Coffee. Now in this episode, we debunk the supposed war on Christmas and invite you into a, a much broader and historical view of what has become the Christmas holiday season and its juxtaposition to the Christian seasons of Advent and Christmas. Seasons that, well, in all honesty, most people just kind of ignore. Some years ago, Fox News, with Bill O'Reilly at the helm, sparked a war on Christmas. If you refuse to say Merry Christmas or tell your employees you are not allowed to, that I will put you on the air and hurt your business. Yes, you heard me right. Bill O'Reilly actually started the war on Christmas. Not the liberals, not corporations. He rallied against companies who were making their employees say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. <laughs> Then the war turned toward Starbucks. Some evangelical Christians are very upset that the coffee giant is doing away with symbols of the season like the snowflakes, the snowmen, and the other kind of ornaments. In Fox News' efforts to defend their brand of Christmas as a Christian holiday, they described a season that starts after Thanksgiving and ends on December 25th. Somehow, in the midst of all this, in 2013, Jesus and Santa Claus also became white. Jesus yeah. was a white man too. I don't even know where to go with that one. Somewhere in the fourth and fifth centuries, an idea took shape of a season of anticipation leading up to the day Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus. The name of that season became what we know as Advent, to come, to, to anticipate the arrival of something. Similar to Lent, Advent was a time of fasting and praying. Now in the West, Advent came to start the Sunday closest to the Feast of St. Martin, which is November 30th. In the East, Advent starts in mid-November. By the late medieval period, Advent had fully become a period of penitence before the celebration of the Feast of Christ, or the Christ Mass, Christmas. In the 20th century, Christmas tide began shifting farther and farther back into December, and Advent has been pushed into near oblivion. By the late 20th century, Christmas was really no longer a religious season. It was a, a secular celebration that involved a, a jolly old elf named St. Nicholas or Santa Claus. Just last week, we witnessed Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, concluding with jolly old St. Nick announcing the start of the modern Christmas present buying season. Have you noticed that Black Friday doesn't even start on Friday anymore. Now, it began back in 1952 and named supposedly for factory workers calling in sick the day after Thanksgiving so they could enjoy a four-day weekend. Now, we see Christmas trees and, and decorations gracing store shelves right next to Halloween costumes. The thing is, in the Christmas tradition, Christmas, or the Feast of Christ, doesn't actually begin until December 25th. What? It goes until Epiphany, which is celebrated on January 6th. It is the revealing of Jesus as the savior of the world, not just of the Jews, indicated by the famous visit of the Magi, or astrologers who came from the East. And they gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and there's a the 12 days of Christmas are actually December 25th to January 6th. What? Here's another little tidbit. The celebration of Jesus' birth on December 25th didn't actually start until well into the fourth century. In fact, many scholars suggest that Jesus was more likely born sometime in the spring. The truth is, however, that we just don't know because the, the whole birth narratives of Jesus that we have in, in Matthew's and Luke's Gospels didn't really develop until late in the first century, decades after Jesus. Paul's letters, the earliest Christian writings that we have, only mention Jesus' birth once and only in reference to him being, quote, born of a woman. What holiday 
is Santa celebrating? Now, Mark's gospel, presumably the oldest of the four gospels, doesn't even have a birth narrative. December 25th was finally chosen as a substitute for a pagan holiday acknowledging the winter solstice. Winter solstice? When the days finally started growing longer and the nights finally started growing shorter. It was called Saturnalia. It lasted for several days, sometimes up to a week. People pushed the blues of the darkness away with candles and all kinds of festivities and was considered by Christians to be an abomination. It was, it was pagan worship. Eventually, the Roman Catholic Church tried to shift the holiday away from the pagan celebrations and into a celebration of God's light shining in the darkness. However, people are people. Drunken revelry really never went away. In fact, in the 17th century, Puritans in England were able to make Christmas celebrations illegal because there was so much revelry going on. The Christmas that we celebrate in the U.S. and much of the West is actually a pagan holiday. What? Christians attempted to co-opt it, pretty much failed at it, and now, well, the pagans are just taking it back. They can have it. There is a difference between the, the secular Christmas holiday celebrated in the United States with rampant consumer spending, a jolly old elf named Santa Claus, crazy decorations mixed with Snoopy and snowmen and reindeer, and the Christ Mass, or Feast of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, that is celebrated December 25th through January 6th by followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Now we Christians need to understand that this is just an honoring of Jesus' birth because we really don't know for sure when he was born. For hundreds of years, his birth actually meant very little to Christians. It was his life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection, which shaped the Christian life of faith. And Advent, well, it was just a season set aside to, to deeply ponder the idea of the incarnation of God. Advent, like Lent, invites us to consider the deeper meanings of the stories of faith, to consider the incarnation of God within creation itself. It's an opportunity to reflect on our faith, our embodiment of God's love revealed in and through Jesus for the sake of the world. I'm starting a new segment here at Faith and Coffee, and it's called, What You Reading? What you read, what you read, books are cool. What you read, get smart, grow your brain. There are a few books I want to recommend this Advent season, and one is called The First Christmas by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. In this book, Borg and Crossan challenge our 21st century enlightenment fact fundamentalist minds to look beyond and into the world of theological imagination. We forgot about parable. Parables are intended to, to challenge the hearers to wrestle with the story. They have a moral, but they also speak of deeper truths, which Borg and Crossan believe is how most Christians through the ages actually viewed the birth narratives. Borg and Crossan suggest that viewing the birth narratives as factual is something that actually developed only in the last several hundred years. Likely since the Enlightenment, according to the Gospels, Jesus regularly used parable to tell hyperbolic stories in order to make a point. He was challenging his listeners to go beyond the facts of human life and consider the deeper meanings. So why wouldn't those writing books about him do the same thing? The other book I want to suggest is Bruce David Forbes' book, Christmas, A Candid Story. The book emerged from his own curiosity about how Christmas actually came to be the way it is. One more book that I recommend is one we're actually using in our adult Christian education at my church. I, I'm hoping I'm saying her name correctly. Heidi Haverkamp's Advent in Narnia. It's a great book that explores the theological themes of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, focusing primarily on the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's set up as a, basically a four-week read, and at the very end, it actually has uh, some suggestions for group study for a four-week group study meeting once a week. It's an awesome book, so I encourage you to read it and use it, if not this year, then at least next year. I have links to all these books below, and if you use those links to buy the books, you're actually supporting Faith and Coffee through Amazon's Associates program. So thank you in advance for that.
no matter how you celebrate this holiday, I hope you'll take some time in the coming weeks to consider how you might more deeply and intentionally invite God to become incarnate in your life. This Advent season, I encourage you to, to take a break from all the, the hustle and bustle. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses down the street. Maybe just put up one string of lights over your house just to remind you of the light of Christ that shines in the darkness, the love of God that remains with us and within us, even on the longest, coldest, and loneliest of nights. Now, if you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. It really helps me grow this channel and hopefully reach more people. If you wanna make sure to see more, then please be sure to subscribe to the Faith and Coffee channel on YouTube. There's a link for that down below or at the end of this video. I appreciate your support. If there's a topic you'd like me to explore, please leave it in the comments down below or you can send me an email to eric at faithandcoffee.com. Thanks for watching and may you have a meaningful advent, a very Merry Christmas tide and a blessed new year. I'll see you next time. Bless. <laughs>